to the Master. Uh, it's always great to be gathered with you all today in this, uh, in this place and to be able to worship God together and receive from His Word. And if this is the first time that you and I are meeting, I would love to meet with you personally, but otherwise my name is Andrew and I have the pr- uh, privilege of working with the youth and children's ministries here at LCM. Now, contramans, I'm about the only thing, me and a song, between you getting your nerves done. So, appreciate you hanging tight. <laughs> uh, two Sundays ago, uh, if you're keeping track, I was not here. I was unable, unable to be with you all, as Larissa and I were at a wedding up north in Walker, Minnesota, celebrating unity and new beginnings. And now, three Sundays ago, many, if not all of us, were um, celebrating unity and new beginnings also here at the church. And although Pastor Dan has been serving as a senior pastor for close to a year, uh, definitely a checkpoint has been crossed in LCM's history as we have called and received Pastor Dan as our new senior pastor. Also, as I look around outside, and you have probably noticed as well, there's a lot of vibrant and bright colors, green trees, green grass, pink lilacs, all sorts of things are growing and coming up. New growth is coming up as the seasons change from what was to what is to what is to come. And I was so captivated, in fact, by the beautiful blossoms growing out on 69th, I took a, a couple photos. And if you look kind of between the two of them, you can see the beautiful flower, and I think it's fair to say that there are new beginnings happening at LCM, and that vision and focus are key. As I participated in Pastor Dan's installation service, as I witnessed two beautiful hearts commit and connect to one another forever, and as I drive around and see all this new growth and vegetation that's coming up and out, I cannot help but see activity and newness all around me. Would you agree? All of us who are part of the body of Lutheran Church of the Master are witness to the new season that this church is now in. All of us who live in North America, who live in Minnesota, are witness to this new, warm, life-giving season, meteorological season, that we are in. And even in the church church calendar, we are entering into a new season, starting with Pentecost, reflecting, remembering, and celebrating something that God began centuries ago that we are able to still participate with today. We'll take a few moments to look at verses from the epistle lesson for today, that comes out of the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and verses 14 through 18. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And then moving to verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Now considering the confirmants that we have in this room, just thinking of all the young people, visionary young people that we are connected to, that we have in our midst even, And what do those verses mean for us? What impact, if any, does an event that happened centuries ago have for us in a time and culture that's vastly different from the original context of that event? Let's consider a few of the ingredients that make up this event, putting them against the backdrop of that time and place and the circumstances, and consider um, how it could uh, apply and fit to our modern-day lives and circumstances. To gain a bit of insight as to what is happening in chapter 2 of Acts, let's flip back one chapter and see how Luke starts his subsequent book. Luke has written both his gospel account 
and this book recording the Acts of the Apostles to a recipient addressed as Theophilus. The first line of the book of Acts reads as follows. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. So far, I see a few simple ingredients. We have instructions given by Jesus to his disciples. We have obedience and prayer on the part of, dis- of the disciples. There's also unity and persistence in staying obedient to the instructions. Additionally, from what we read from chapter 2, another major ingredient is the activity and work done by the power of the Holy Spirit, as well as obedient recipients who allowed the Holy Spirit to work through them. As a result, these obedient receivers give witness to God's power, glorifying Him and causing the lives of those around them to be impacted eternally for His name's sake. If you think of it like an open circuit, it starts with God, is connected and closed by God, and is continued by God with His power. It is God, God, God. Not a mixture of God, add in a little bit of what I want to do, a little more God, and then put in what I think feels comfortable, check in with God and ask Him to pray, pray to Him and ask Him to bless what I've created. It is a work originating with God, it is a work empowered by God, and it is a work carried out by God. Now, the people in this story weren't forced to do anything, they had a choice. Imagine if we read Acts 2, and it says something like this. They were all gathered together in the room, waiting and hoping for God to move in their midst. Suddenly, a great thing happened, and the Holy Spirit came upon them like a flame, filling them and enabling them to speak in a new language. They all thought that it was a very meaningful experience, and after another 40 minutes or so, they went to have lunch, followed by a nice afternoon nap. They never downplayed or disagreed with what happened. In fact, they spoke about how good that past experience was every time they got together. They even thought, maybe if we keep doing the same thing and sing the same song that we did when that thing happened, it'll happen again. Not realizing that the power of God was invested inside of them, but they unwittingly prevented him from moving in their midst. Now, of course, we just read the real version, so that's not what happened, and praise God that that isn't what happened. But think about how often we can be tempted to take for granted something that God is doing. Or we've put so much of our own agenda and preferences into something that we obstruct the once clear path and prevent ourselves from even being able to receive from him and see his work done in our lives. Think back to those ingredients we talked about. Jesus instructed his disciples to go to Jerusalem. We'll call that home base. And Jesus told them to wait. They did as he instructed and stayed together waiting for what he promised to happen. When his promise did come to fruition and the Holy Spirit filled them, they did not keep it to themselves, but rather they shared it with literally thousands of people, the life-changing power 
of the risen Lord. On that day of Pentecost, it was like dropping a stone into a smooth, glass-like lake. Activity started in one place, and the ripple effect reached out far and wide. Jesus told his disciples that they would be his witnesses in Jerusalem, home base, Judea, further out, Samaria, even further out, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I think we've got those same similar ingredients here in our own context. God has given us his word, giving this body a mandate that we want to carry out in partnering with him in the mission that he has begun. We want to know Christ and make him known. We've got a home base, an incredible facility for us to gather in and for us to experience unity within. As a collective church body, we too want to receive power from on high. And I believe that that power from the Holy Spirit has come. You know what? There's always more that we can ask for. A fresh and new filling by the Holy Spirit, whether it's the first time or the thousandth time that we've received. Let us never neglect refueling reorienting and being refreshed by the power of the Holy Spirit. If that is something that you would like to do, whether it's the first time or not, myself, Pastor Eldon, Pastor Dan, and I assume several others would also love and be honored to connect and ask with the Lord with you for that. It's nothing scary, spooky, or magical. It's a beautiful, empowering thing. And to be clear, for every Christian, When they come into life-saving and life-changing relationship with God, God enters into relationship with them with his whole self, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. However, what we are talking about today is an awakening, an activation, an empowering that comes from God through the Holy Spirit in us, just as he did for those gathered together in Jerusalem, trusting Jesus at his word some 2,000 years ago. For all of us, For the church that is Lutheran Church the Master, let us be open to this kind of awakening, a reactivation done by the power of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. May we not just be supportive of this type of thing in theory, but rather may we be obedient recipients, putting aside any and all agendas and preferences, being open to receiving from Him and operating with Him under His guidance and direction. When that's in place, May we not forget that the apostles and those gathered with them did something. The Holy Spirit filled them, but they had that choice to open their mouths. In doing so, so many lives were affected positively with an eternal impact for God's glory. May we take action too. Let us not simply encounter the life-saving and life-changing power of God and just call it a nice thing and move on to the next thing on our list. Let us, partnering with God, Join him on his mission to affect the world for his glory. We're good at doing the work within our home base, but may we also look outside our doors and engage with the ends of the earth that are within immediate proximity to us. That is a huge gift and opportunity that God has given to us. God's mission is not something that is only for a select few to carry out and engage in. On Pentecost, Peter stood before the crowd and reminded them of the words of the prophet Joel, saying, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. God has something for everyone, no matter the age and stage of life. Something for everyone to partner with him in his mission to the world. And ask yourself, what does it look like for you to participate with God on the mission that he has begun? What does it look like for us as a church to know Christ and to make him known? Think about it. Ponder it. Ask God about it. Then, what would your life look like if you took that one step with God in engaging with what he is doing? What would our church look like? What would our neighboring community look like? God is not done. God is not done moving in your life. God is not done moving in our church. God is not done moving through our church to impact the community around us. May we be an open and obedient recipients to receive from God and partner with him in what he has already begun.
by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in your Son's name, and we thank you, God, for all that you have given, all that you have poured out of yourself. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you did come. We thank you, Jesus, that your word is true and correct. Thank you, God, that we can engage with you in the mission that you have already started. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us uh, to delve deeper into the things that you have for us to walk in with you. We pray for a refreshing and a renewal by your Holy Spirit and that we would be bold and, and, and brave to, to receive from you and to seek from you what you would have to give to us. We thank you and give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. At this point, I invite the youth choir to come and share.